uh, large scale uh, audiovisual robotic art installation type of work. So, this is what I'm going to talk today. This is not uh, PowerPoint, it's a DVD presentation. I started a bit with the soundtrack. Um, and I'm going to start uh, talking about uh, maybe my most popular work called Historical Machines. In fact, this project, I've uh, presented it uh, many times in South America, in uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina, and also in Lima, Peru. And I'll start with this one because it's probably the most uh, representative of what I do. So it's a large environment uh, integrating machines that respond to the presence of uh, viewers. So they create sound and light and uh, their movement is influenced by uh, the displacement or the the movement of the viewers in the space. Most of my work use very simple uh, technologies such as uh, pneumatics or compressed air uh, distance uh, just to make them more robust because uh, very often th these projects are presented over a very long period of time and uh, you know, as you know, machines have a tendency to break down. So for me, it's sort of a challenge to try to make them survive as long as possible. So that's why I adapted a lot of these uh, very simple but robust uh, techniques. So in, in this video, which is already a little bit old, uh, you don't see the whole family of machines of the historical machines, uh, you see some of them, because right now I'm about 12 of these guys, and uh, I finally decided to sort of uh, close the project by building a giant one called the uh, Mega Historical Machines. And uh, this uh, project has been uh, presented together with the smaller ones uh, in the different festivals in France. So the idea is really to use uh, sound and light as another way for the machine to express uh, different things. So maybe just to give you a little idea of the size of the mega historical machine, it looks ex you know, exactly the same as uh, the regular historical, but uh, it's just a, a little bit bigger. The only thing is that it cannot be as historical uh, as the smaller machines, of course, because that way would be way too dangerous. Especially that I don't put any uh, fence between the viewer and the robot, so the viewers are even allowed to touch the robots if they want. So this one works at a very slower pace. That was just to give you a little peek. So uh, in this uh, very short period of time, I'll try to show you as many works as possible. But I would really like to show you uh, the latest piece, uh, which is called Inferno. So I'll try to reserve the last five minutes for that. Uh, maybe I can continue with La Cour des Miracles, or the Court of Miracles, if you prefer. This one was really the start of the kind of project I the start of the kind of project I'm doing. Um, it goes back to 1997, uh, and the video you, you see there was the shot at the Contemporary Art Museum in Montreal. And uh, this is really why, uh, when we started to get interested into the, uh, the relation between the viewers and the robots and 
the effect of uh, projection and anthrop anthropomorphism and how people are sort of uh, interpreting uh, very abstract objects moving in front of them and responding uh, simply to the presence by of movement of course but also by doing other things like emitting light or emitting sound uh, different sounds giving them some kind of uh, personality so i started to work with machines like almost 25 years ago uh, in fact i'm not an engineer i'm more like uh, coming from music uh, and i got interested in robots because for me it was uh, a way to animate sound and light and space and uh, a way to have a certain control over it and be able to create some interactive relationship with the viewers. The first project I made uh, with uh, Louis-Philippe Demers, who uh, was more coming from theater and lighting, uh, was uh, sort of a, a replication of the same unit uh, a certain number of times. The first project was called Espace Vectoriel, so there were uh, sound and light robotic tubes that were projecting sound uh, towards the, the viewers as they were moving in, uh, in the installation space. The second project was pretty similar, except that they were those underwater type of robots. This one was called the Frenchman Lake, uh, but it was still working on the idea of replication and uh, creating a kind of social behaviors, group behaviors uh, from a collective of machines. But with uh, La Cour de Mira, the project that you see there, it was really uh, a starting point in creating uh, different species uh, of machines that have different uh, specific behaviors uh, and played a specific role into the, the whole uh, theatrical setup. So this, you know, this uh, idea eventually evolved a little bit more, uh, and uh, we really got interested in you know, how abstract the machine could be to seem as alive as possible. So it was really not to try to replicate any living organism or any animal or any person. Uh, it was to try to get away as, as much as possible from that. And, and just by creating different reactions, by movement, sound and light, uh, towards the presence of the viewers, to create this illusion that the animated object was somehow becoming alive. Of course, like in this case of the limping machine, you know, as soon as you add something that looks like an arm or, uh, or a leg, uh, automatically people start to uh, project things like, oh, they see uh, animals or they see uh, dancers or they see insects. Uh, but uh, no, the, really the, the idea is to try to demonstrate that it's not by adding uh, skin or fur or, or, or anything that would make the robot look like if it's you know, sort of a human or an animal that uh, it can still look like if there's some kind of uh, autonomy or some kind of uh, self-consciousness uh, into the robot. Even though we all know that it's not the case, it's just about creating this illusion of uh, an internal life inside the machine. So this one I'll stop here. I'll show you something a bit more recent. Oops, sorry. This is a, a totally different type of project called Grace Tech Machines. And uh, this one really uh, shows how abstract we can get into uh, the visual aspect of the, of the robot. Uh, and also it shows another thing that we do. When, when I say we, I mean uh, my collaborators, my assistants, my students. Uh, when we build these machines, 
is to try to subvert the uh, scientific research as much as we can, rather than doing the, the, you know, the research ourselves, we try to uh, twist it a little bit. Like in this case, we, the robots are just a set of different steward platforms piled onto each other uh, to create very complex type of movements out of a very simple uh, basic stru structure. In this case, it was a bit different from the previous project that I did. It's not an installation, it's really a, a, a show on stage where a dancer interacts with the robot. So she wears a, a very specific type of motion detection system and the robot reacts to the different movement that she's doing. So what you don't see in this video is that we made uh, other types of similar kind of robots that were more responsive, in fact, to, uh, to, the, to the dancer because we had a more sophisticated type of uh, feedback system in them. So she was completely surrounded by uh, those kind of worm-like type of creatures. Another uh, recent work called DSM-6. So this installation uh, is a bit similar to uh, La, Co La Co des Mirages or historical machines, but the uh, inspiration, uh, you know, where the idea comes from, was a bit different because then I was more inspired by uh, how robots could sort of also have mental diseases. So this is what is called DSM-6, because at the time I was uh, sort of uh, inspired by the DSM-4 uh, Bible of Psychiatry. And uh, my, uh, my intention was not to sort of replicate uh, the description of the different uh, human mental diseases, but to just show that if we project ourselves in machines and we see that you know, machines can be intelligent and uh, so much this or that, well, they can also have the same kind of problems that we have, such as mental problems. So at main machines, like this one here, which is an autistic machine, so it's a machine that kind of lives in its own world, uh, it, it even has some uh, kind of uh, face tracking system uh, that allows it to sort of turn away from people if somebody is looking at it. It can also see faces in the environment where there's no faces at all and then it starts staring at this virtual, uh, invisible face. Uh, and these ones, they're more like the psychotic machines. They have different reactions uh, to the viewers coming close to them. So the reason why I use this type of environment, you know, sort of a very industrial, um, at the same time a very theatrical uh, type of setup, is really because I want to create uh, a very special world for my robots, where it becomes easier for the viewer to start interpreting different things, uh, start projecting different things into these uh, creatures. So Red Light is another similar project. Except that here, in this case, the, the detournement, you know, like this sort of uh, subversion of the uh, scientific research was made on the actuators themselves, because we build a series of uh, what they call the uh, Mackinnon actuators, which are pneumatic air muscles, and they're very easy to, to build. Uh, if, but the problem is that if you try to build them, to buy them in the, you know, off the shelf, they're extremely expensive. So we decided to make our own. Well, it's very simple, it's just a tube and a plastic mesh 
that allows the tube not to explode if ever it's inflated. And it works like a muscle because as soon as you inflate it, it contracts. And uh, if you, like in this case, I, you know, sort of align them in a linear way, one after the other, like put them in a chain, you can uh, sort of obtain a very, or you can amplify the, the movement uh, very much. And the result is a very fluid uh, type of movement, a very organic type of movement, uh, out of something very solid. Because the, you know, like the structure of the robot itself is all made of aluminum. But the fact that you know, it's made of a lot of joints and uh, that these uh, pneumatic muscles can stretch in different directions, uh, this gives uh, the, the machines It's a very flexible type of uh, motion. But once again, it works the same way as the other projects. You know, there are sensors that pick up the presence of the viewers in the, in the space, and the robots will you know, decide to go one way or another, or react one way or another, depending on how close the viewers are from them. Uh, or how many people are around the road. Uh, maybe just uh, another peek in the past. For a show I did with Louis Philippe de Mers, uh, that was part of a theater play by Robert Lepage, which is a famous uh, Famous choreographer, not choreographer, but uh, uh, theater uh, creator in Quebec. And uh, he made this uh, piece where suddenly robots appear in, in the theater place. And these are the machines we made for this, for this play that was at the origin supposed to be a cabaret. Speaking of Cabaret, that's the, the next project I'm working on, uh, after the one I'm going to show you uh, in a second. So the, I'm still at the beginning of this project, but that's it. That's going to be a, a very kitsch uh, type of project where robots will uh, dance and make music on stage uh, and there will be a lot of feathers and uh, sparkling things and mirror balls and things like that and uh, the idea is to try to see how far I can go into the kitchen still keeping the sort of uh, you know, industrial uh, a bit aggressive type of uh, aesthetics that I have with uh, my other projects, so it's going to be a, a little challenge. So having covered very briefly uh, some of my projects, I will show you the last one, which uh, I just finished recently. It was presented in France uh, two weeks ago in Paris and one week ago in Nantes, France. And here I have to be careful because the sun is very young. So this, late, uh, this last project is also a collaboration with Louis-Philippe de Mers. Uh, and it's called Inferno. And this project is very different from, from what we did before because in this case, uh, we made uh, wearable robots or exoskeletons that the viewers are wearing on themselves. So it's not you know, only machines there in the space, but it's machines that you know, become part uh, of the public or the public that becomes part of the machine, we don't know yet. Uh, and this is sort of rough footage that uh, we got from uh, the first show in Paris. 
where you can see uh, we had about 24, 25 of these uh, exhaust cartoons on stage and the public wearing the robots. So the robots, you know, the, of course the, the viewers are attached to the robots uh, and the robots impose certain movements to the viewers. So then it becomes possible to create uh, synchronized choreographies or of course total chaos but still imposing things, imposing what we want to uh, the, the viewers. So in this case there is no specific feedback system for the viewer who wears the robot but uh, we can decide because we're present on stage and we can decide to uh, manipulate the viewers according to what's going on uh, in the space. Of course, the fact that we use the public as uh, you know, it's a participative experience, so we use the public, it becomes uh, very unpredictable. We don't know what, you know what will happen at some point. Uh, of course, people are allowed to uh, sort of stop and get out of the, of the robot as they want. Uh, but from what we've seen up to now, people, people really enjoy it, uh, which sometimes conflicts a little bit with the theme uh, of the show, which is infernal. In fact, it's not really a, like a, a descent to, uh, to hell, but uh, it's sort of a, it becomes sort of a play between the viewers and the, the system itself and also a play between the viewers and the viewers because they can all see each other and uh, become some kind of game uh, after a certain time. But in this case, we still use the same uh, type of atmosphere, uh, the, the, the same type of, uh, of control, except that for this show, we had uh, different sections, some composed of more uh, industrial ambient uh, type of music, and others that, like the one you just saw there, that uh, was more uh, dance, uh, techno oriented. We can show you more until I get uh, kicked out. So this is the the end uh, section. Because it's a it's a it's a show of about an hour. So it's a very long time for people to wear uh, the robot which weighs about uh, 20 kilos. As you can see there, because at the end of the show you see some some of the uh, robots are empty because people some people decided not to uh, to continue. But there are some very courageous ones. We're still dancing uh, even after an hour. And I should say also that the, the process of getting into the robot itself, like the dressing process, uh, is part of the show. So as soon as uh, you know, we pick up who's going to, you know, the volunteers who are going to wear the robots, then the public enters uh, the stage and uh, we start the show and uh, people like the volunteers are dressed one after the other so that takes about 15 minutes and then the whole thing starts and what from the feedback that we have received it's really about letting yourself go, letting yourself be controlled by the system and then you enter some kind of trance. Of course, because of the music, you have a tendency to start dancing, but I think it's also a way to uh, sort of uh, get rid of the weight of the robot because um, as, as you move your whole body, uh, it becomes a little bit less painful to wear the whole thing. Oh, it's not that bad. 
So we were also adding some uh, variations uh, live as to show what's going on. So this is something that's you know, completely new uh, for us, and it just you know, this video is not even edited yet, so uh, it's, it's you know, freshly out from the oven. So of course, there's a lot of things that we are going to fine tune uh, in the you know, next months, and uh, eventually we hope that we'll be able to bring this thing to uh, South America and, of course, to Colombia. Uh, one day. So Robert, if you want to uh, talk, you're gonna have to keep me up because I just removed the, the video. Okay, thank you. Uh, finished.